I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to Psalm 22. Psalm 22, and if you're using the Pew Bible, uh, the page number will come up in just a second. I want to encourage you also, if you don't have a Bible or if you have someone in your life that needs a Bible, to always remember those Pew Bibles are yours to take, to keep. If you're using a tablet or a phone and you use the YouVersion Bible app, those instructions will get you right to Psalm 22, page 377, by the way, in that Pew Bible. But as you're getting there, uh, I want to share a little story. When, when I was about to start fourth grade, uh, my parents actually bought their first home. And on the first day of moving into that house, I met two boys who were about my age, and they invited me to go on a bike ride to check out the surrounding neighborhood. And I asked my parents, and they said that was great, and I thought it was going to be fun. And we were riding around for about an hour when all of a sudden they ditched me. And apparently, I found this out later, they thought it was going to be a funny story that we'd all laugh about. But if any of you know me at all or remember something I've shared recently, I am seriously directionally challenged. So having no sense of direction and being new to this neighborhood, I found myself terribly lost and understandably afraid. Uh, Honestly, nothing as I was riding around was familiar to me. Being so disoriented as I was from, again, the, the stress of not really knowing a sense of direction, every street sign, every landmark that I passed was just one big blur. And I can remember with every turn, my anxiety with my bicycle, my anxiety just kept increasing and I kept riding around in what seemed like circles the whole time waiting and hoping and praying that my parents were going to notice I was missing and come find me. Now, I don't know how it was when you grew up, but where I grew up, when I grew up, the kind of the rule of thumb was you went out and as long as you were home by the time the sun went down, you were fine. So I was riding around for hours and all of a sudden the sun started to go down and that's when I really started to freak out. Um, By the time it was getting dark, all that stress, you know, had traveled from my brain to my body. I was sweating. I felt weak. I couldn't breathe. I was breathing quick and shallow. And I remember it. I finally just burst into tears. I just lost it, you know? And just to give a happy end to this story, in that moment, very quickly, eventually, thanks to the kindness of a stranger, I found my way home. But what I remember from that experience so profoundly is just an overwhelming feeling of total isolation, of just feeling completely alone at a point of, there was a point where I felt like I was beyond the reach of my parents, you know, like that was it, this was it, this was, I was going to stay in this state for the rest of my life. And I, and I bring all this up, the, the distinctiveness of that memory, because sometimes we can have a very similar experience in our relationship with the Holy Spirit. Abraham, Joseph, Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Elijah, the Apostle Paul, Martin Luther, C.S. Lewis, Dr. Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa, quite a list of names. And what they all have in common is having a season in their lives, sometimes more than one, where they couldn't feel or hear God, where they had no sense whatsoever of the Spirit's presence. And if that list wasn't enough, let's consider David, the shepherd boy, right? The shepherd boy who became king of Israel, the one who was famed to be a person after God's own heart. In the catalog of lyrical poetry, David recorded for us in the book of Psalms, what you've opened up to is not one of his most requested tracks. It is not considered one of his greatest hits, unless you've been there, unless you understand how he feels. For what David describes here in Psalm 22 is anything but feeling close to the Lord. Rather, as we're about to hear, he feels completely removed from the presence of the one that he's loved and held dear. In your Bibles or following me on the screen, let's hear from Psalm 22. David writes, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? Are you so far from saving me? So far from the cries of my anguish? My God, I I cry out to you by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I, I'm a worm, not a man. 
scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Well, let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Wow. The problem and the pattern for David quickly emerged just in the first two verses, right? I mean, David groans to God, but God's presence seems far away. And so David feels forsaken. David cries to God day and night, but there seems to be no answer from the Lord. And so David has no peace. He can find no rest. And as he goes on in verses three through eight, David shares how abandoned he feels. In essence, he says, our ancestors cried out to you and you answered them, but not me. Not hearing from you, Lord, not able to sense your presence, I'm left feeling like a worm scurrying around aimlessly, ridiculed, mocked, despised by everyone around me. I find what David describes here is what many followers of Jesus have gone through, through a stretch of time, sometimes even a prolonged period, when they've prayed and reached out to God and received or perceived absolute silence in response. Sometimes what can cause the most pain and confusion in following Jesus isn't what the Spirit says to us, but the ongoing feeling that the Spirit isn't there at all. It feels almost as if the the Spirit is hiding from us or for some reason withholding his reviving presence. Keeping it real, just being speaking for me in my life, there have been more than a few times when I just couldn't hear. I just couldn't sense a thing in my relationship with the Holy Spirit. Perhaps you've had the same experience. You pray, you know, you listen, you ask, you seek, you knock, and you hear nothing but deafening silence. You search, you look, You scan the horizon for a sign, just a little direction, and you can't see anything, not even the fingerprint of God. If you've ever walked through this particular valley of feeling abandoned, dry, desperate for a sign, some sense that the Lord is still with you, then this message is for you. And if you're sitting here today and you have no idea what I'm talking about, this, is, this sermon is still a message you need to hear because it's not a question of if, but when. We will wonder. We will worry. We will doubt that the Holy Spirit is still there, still listening, still caring, still working. In fact, it's so common an experience. It's what the Christian mystics of old have referred to as the dark night of the soul. It's a term that was first coined by St. John of the Cross. And if you want to go deeper into that or if you're in the throes of it, it's a book that's not an easy read but that I highly recommend. And the dark night of the soul, again, is this description, this feeling of being alone, of feeling distant, of feeling isolated from God, of not being able to sense the Lord's presence, of getting nothing back but silence from God. And and it leaves you feeling empty. It leaves you feeling pointless and purposeless. Nothing seems to have any sense of meaning at all. You feel like you're going through the motions. You feel like everything, it's it's just a farce. It's an exercise. It's empty. It's dead. Because that's how you feel. That's how you feel God is treating you. And I want to just say right from the outset, whether you're here this morning and you know exactly what I'm talking about, maybe you're in the thick of it or you again have no clue, I want you to hear that feeling, that experience is very, very real. It is real for us. And it begs the question, why? Why? Why does God sometimes leave us feeling alone? Why? Why does it sometimes feel like God is silent in our lives? And full confession here, right from the start, I don't know the definitive answer to these questions. All I've got for us this morning is what we can glean from the word of God and what I can share from my own personal experience of living by that spirit and out of that word. 
So we're entering into gray territory here. We're entering into the thin spaces, as some like to call it. And I want to begin in trying to answer these questions again through the Word of God and from my experience putting that Word by the Spirit into practice. I want to begin by addressing what the experience of God's perceived silence or absence is not about. And I, I, I want to start here because I know for me in my own journey, it was so important when I understood what it's not about. It's important because many Christians, I find, assume or have been taught the perceived, their perceived silence or absence of God means they have done something wrong. And therefore, our Father has turned his face from them. Sometimes, I don't know if you've experienced this, sometimes in the Christian community, we actually push the, push the false logic of this assertion that somehow if we are receiving silence from God or perceive the absence of God, that we've done something wrong. Sometimes we push this even further, suggesting if you aren't receiving endless waves of the joy and peace of the Holy Spirit cascading over your soul, then maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I want to clarify that that is not the message of the Bible. And I want to also make it clear, and I've tried to be careful about this, that that has not been the message of this sermon series in our relationship with the Holy Spirit. This sermon series is about growing in that relationship. That is not what I have sought to convey because that is not what the Word of God says. As hard as this may be for some of us to hear, Despite how we often sell it to others, despite how it often gets sold to us by other Christians, following Jesus is not a daily cavalcade of burning bush moments where the leading of the Spirit and the hand of God are dramatically, tangibly, and clearly visible for us. Sometimes, more often than we like or care to admit, sometimes for longer than we perceive we can bear, God feels absent from our lives. The Lord can seem silent and invisible. But when we walk through this shadow of doubt, let's be clear, it is not a severing of our relationship with Jesus. It is not somehow the loss of our salvation in Christ. This is so important to hear. Walking through this valley is not a punishment or rebuke by the Spirit of God because of our failures, our brokenness, our sin. Yes, yes, when we choose to follow our own will rather than the Lord's will through the leading of the Word and the Spirit, our Father will let us go our own way. Yes, God has given us a free will and the Lord has given us the freedom to use it. However, our freedom to choose to not follow the Spirit's leading in a particular area of our lives does not negate, negate the greater freedom of the Lord to be relentless in following after us. When we turn from the person of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit doesn't shrug and walk away. The Spirit continues to pursue us to repeatedly tap us on the shoulder, to wait for us to turn around, to long for us to come back where we belong. God never turns his back on us. He is long-suffering in his patience. He is steadfast in his love. He is abounding and abiding in his grace toward us. That is the very definition of his character by his own, from his own mouth. And again, think about it. If you're doubting this, if you're struggling with this, think about in the scriptures, how many times in his relationship with Israel, how many times God in his relationship with Israel declares his frustration like this. Israel has gone off the reservation. Israel is blowing God off. Israel is like outright, you know, dismissing God, you know, rejecting God. And God, we find this again and again in the Old Testament, right? God will declare his frustration. That's it. I'm done with you. I'm out of this relationship. It's over. Don't move too fast. Because God will say this, and then if you keep reading very, very quickly in the same breath, in the midst of his broken heart, then the Lord will say, I'm out of this, but I'm going to be right here waiting for you. And I'm not just going to sit idly by. I'm going to make a way for you to come back to me, even despite yourself. We see it again and again. God is the lover who refuses to give up on us, who refuses to give up on us. I'm going to share a much more personal, intimate story with you what I, when I think about that, this reflection of God's character in our, in our Bible. Um, 
my wife and I, Beth, as, you, as many of you know, started dating in high school. And we dated for several years until my wife broke up with me. And I was devastated. I was very upset. And my wife very quickly realized she had made a mistake. And she came back and tried to resume our relationship. And I was an absolute jerk. Out of my pain, out of whatever, my arrogance, I was like, well, sorry that you realized you made a mistake, but I'm a free agent now. <laughs> and there are people out there that are clearly waiting for me. As I said, I was a jerk. And in my just ridiculousness, I put her through a lot of pain. I was stupid. I'm not going to say anything more than to say I was stupid. And we were still friends, and she endured that pain and continued to endure it until one day she came to me and said words that I'll never forget, words that not only was she speaking, but I was convinced at that time the Holy Spirit was speaking when she said, Chris, you've hurt me a lot, but here's the thing. I am the best thing that's ever happened to you, and I'm just waiting for you to figure it out. I bring this up, and I'm not trying to say that my wife is God. Pretty darn close, but not God. <laughs> because that's God. That's God's posture towards us. Always and forever. I am the best thing that's ever happened to you. And I'm just waiting for you to figure it out. Beloved, never, ever, let the perceived silence of God, the feeling of the Lord's absence from your life, cause you to question the certainty and security of his relationship with you. Because the thing is, from the start of this relationship with all of us, from the start of this relationship, our Heavenly Father has seen us at our very worst Right? Let's go back all the way to the beginning. From the first, hiding, naked, and afraid in denial of our betrayal in the garden. And then fast forward all the way to this. Openly, defiantly, violently, wrongly daring to put him to death on a cross. God has seen us at our very worst, and yet despite the worst we can do to ourselves, to each other, even to God, to him, nothing can or will separate us from his love. And there is no more definitive proof of this than God coming down to be with us in Jesus, than God in Christ suffering and dying for us on the cross. While we were yet sinners, God embraced us in a relationship of mercy love, and forgiveness. And the Lord promises that that embrace is airtight. He will never let us go. Jesus promises he will never leave us or forsake us. And while from our vantage point, we may feel we are separated from God, we may perceive God as being silent. And again, both that feeling and that perception are very real for us. I do not want you to hear me negating that. From our perception, from our sense, God is silent and we feel separated from him. And that's real for us. The truth is in the midst of that very real feeling, God remains with us and for us even when we can't see him. Even when we can't hear him even when we can't feel him. We are never alone even when we feel alone because part of what we need to understand about what Christ did for us through the cross is this. Jesus faced and filled in the isolation and silence born of our sin, the divorce from God through our rejection and rebellion against him. Jesus, in fact, began this very work in the Garden of Gethsemane as he prayed. Do you remember this? Do you remember this moment? Do you remember how it's described? Here in the Garden of Gethsemane, for the first time in his human life, Jesus encountered true and utter silence. And this is, this is in contrast to the Jesus we see throughout the Gospels who is in constant communion with the Father. He, Jesus will say on a regular basis, I only do what the Father tells me. The Father and I are one. I, he continually points and appeals to the Father. But here, Jesus, for the first time in his human life, encounters true and utter silence. Twice, 
Not once, twice, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane asked for comfort and assurance from God. And twice, Jesus looked into the abyss of humanity's separation from God and received no answer. Mark's gospel, in fact, remarks that this led, twice not hearing anything, this led Jesus to be overcome with a sense of absolute horror. Mark describes that the ultimate terror of screaming into the void and hearing nothing but the sound of your own voice nearly killed Jesus right then and there. So overwhelming to the point of death was this sense of isolation upon Jesus that he began, do you remember it? It's described for us. He began to sweat drops of blood. A medical condition where one is under such great strain that the capillaries in one's body literally burst. You see, Jesus' crucifixion began long before he was nailed to the cross as he looked into the total aloneness of the human condition apart from God at Gethsemane. And once he was on the cross, Jesus stared into the yawning darkness of our isolation and separation from God as the shadow of death slowly overtook him. His body bruised and bleeding, his breathing labored and weak, his eyes rolling back into his head. As Jesus looked up toward heaven, all he could see was hell staring back at him. Jesus, Jesus whose voice cast out demons and calmed violent storms. Jesus whose voice healed the most crippling of diseases and brought life back to the lifeless. Jesus could only muster a whisper of a scream, crying out these wary words from David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My friends, when we declare, when we believe Jesus exchanged his life for ours on the cross, paid the price for our sin, and embraced our death, this includes Jesus enduring our separation our complete aloneness from our Heavenly Father. What I'm saying is Jesus looked into that abyss so we would never have to. Jesus took upon himself the utter isolation that is our existence when we turned our face from God. Jesus closed that gnawing, terrifying abyss so that we would never have to wonder, never have to worry, never have to believe our Father will ever turn his face away from us. This is so important that we start here. It's so important we lay this foundation. It's so important that we understand that our greatest fear, our biggest doubt about our relationship with the Holy Spirit is never true. We are not alone. We will not be abandoned. Silence is not all will we will be left with. And while that foundation is so important, it still remains, and I acknowledge it. I've been there. The question still remains, even if all of this is true, and it is, the question remains why sometimes it feels like the Spirit's presence and movement aren't as obvious or as perceptible as they are at other times in our lives. Another way of putting this is why God is seemingly less directive and less hands-on than he is at other times in our lives. And again, I don't have complete answers for you. But part of the reason, it seems from the witness of Scripture, is that God seeks in these seasons to grow and mature us. You know, and Part of the reason why I think we often get convinced or tell others or spread this sort of incomplete gospel that, you know what, you you only, if you don't have the Holy Spirit cascading over your soul, peace and joy at every moment, if you're not having these constant, dramatic, overt, explicit, burning bush moments, then you don't really have a relationship with Jesus. Part of why we do this is because we selectively read our Bible. We like to read what I like to call all the firework sections. We dig that, man. We, yeah, that's good stuff but we gloss over, we ignore all the stuff between the fireworks. We fail to notice something, that there are frequent gaps consistently in the scripture, frequent gaps between what God initiates in a person's life and when and how God's work in someone's life comes to fruition. 
When the Lord calls someone, we see this again and again in the scriptures, when the Lord calls someone to follow him in the Bible, God often sends that person through a journey in the wilderness. Just ask Abraham. Just ask Joseph or Moses or David or Paul. I mean, how long? You ever think about this? How long did Abraham and Sarah have to wait to hear back from God on that child they were promised in the midst of their old age and infertility? How long did Joseph have to wait after being sold into slavery by his brothers until he finally caught another vision of the dream God intended to fulfill through his life? Moses waited in silence for 40 years as a fugitive in the wilderness before he saw his burning bush and heard the voice of God. David was anointed the next king of Israel by Samuel, but his coronation wasn't for decades later. In the meantime, he just returned back to the family pasture to tend sheep. Even his legendary battle with big old bad Goliath didn't happen right away. And then there's Paul, right? Paul, thrown from his horse on that Damascus road, converted from a persecutor of Christians to a follower of Jesus. And yet, it would be three long years in the desert and then another 14 years sitting on the bench until the Spirit would call his number to go and spread the gospel. Sometimes, not all the time, sometimes the very reason for our wilderness journey is to break us down in order to raise and build us back up. And if that, you know, if that doesn't sound very appealing to you, if that scares you, and it's it's scared me, that's not what you want to hear, consider this. God often does his best work behind the scenes. In the thick of the valley where we can't perceive that anything is happening, when everything feels dead because we feel dead, and in fact, God is bringing life. We worship a God of resurrection. We worship a God who promises resurrection. And in promising resurrection, in bringing resurrection, God says we have to die to ourselves. There can be no resurrection if we don't die to ourselves. I know that none of us want to hear that, but that's the gospel. We have to die to ourselves. And it's not just physical death. We die to ourselves many, many times in this life before we come to the grave. And in the thick of it all, God says, every single time, you don't have to be afraid. Every single time, yes, it sucks. Yes, it hurts. But every single time, I am there with you. And every single time, I will raise you up. God often does his best work behind the scenes when we think nothing is happening. Consider, consider how Joseph was being prepared during his extended prison sentence, first in slavery and then being stuck in an actual jail cell. Through his wilderness experience, Joseph learned how to run a large household, Potiphar, right? So that he could eventually run a whole nation and save a country and its surrounding neighbors from starvation. Or how about David? David wasn't just killing time, tending the flocks when he was anointed while waiting to be anointed king of Israel. Out in the pasture, David acquired the skill to slay a giant. Among the lowly sheep, David was given the insight to rejoice in knowing the Lord as his shepherd. The journey through the wilderness with the Lord is hard, but it is not for our despair. It is for our growth and maturity, the strengthening of our faith, the building of our trust, the refinement of our character. When everything else is stripped away, the treasure of our heart is revealed and clearly seen. Sometimes we think we know the treasure of our heart. We tell others what the treasure of our heart is. We tell ourselves. Sometimes we think we know what the treasure of our heart is, but it often takes walking through the wilderness to confront the idols that distract and rival for our affections. Sometimes when everything else is stripped away and silence is all we have, we discover why we are in this relationship with the person of God through Christ. Are we in it for the benefits and the blessings of Christ? Or are we in it in order to be with Jesus, to engage, to learn from, to grow in and out? out of that relationship? Are the Lord's promises enough for us? Or are we just in this relationship based upon what the Lord can do for me right here, right now? 
Can we walk by faith in the promises of God alone? Even when we can't hear, even when we can't see or feel those promises ringing true in our lives? Sometimes we need to go through the wilderness so we can truly get to know Jesus because the thing is, we can't truly know Jesus is all we need until Jesus is all we have. You can't truly know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. So how do you do this? How do we walk through the wilderness? I mean, how do we keep going when we can't see where we're going? How do we not go crazy, right? How do you not go crazy from the perceived silence as we wait for the Lord to speak? I mean, how do we fend off those fears and worries? And they come, they rise up, those doubts. How do we fend off those fears and worries that how we're feeling now is going to become the permanent future of our relationship with God? I've got a couple of encouragements for you. Word, encouragements from wor- the word of God, encouragements from my own life. And I want to be really careful that you hear me. These are encouragements for you to hold fast and to hold tight. These encouragements are not a rebuke. These encouragements are not somehow saying, well, this is your problem. This is why this isn't happening. These encouragements aren't somehow diagnosing what you're going through right now. These are encouragements in the midst of a very real, palpable feeling of how to just stay on, stay keeping on. So hear them as they're intended. And my first encouragement is don't give up. Don't give up. Don't stop praying, talking to God. Daily, David models that posture for us of persistent prayer here in Psalm 22. He keeps talking. Job did the very same thing as he walked through his dark night of the soul. Keep praying and don't let up. Scream if you have to. Continue to speak through tears as they fall. Just keep talking and listening, even in the seemingly nonsensical groans that can rise out of our desperation and exhaustion. And I say this especially, those groans that were like, this is meaningless, it just expresses our pain, but it says nothing. Not true, because one of the most underappreciated works of the Holy Spirit is to enable us to lift up to heaven what we can no longer put into human words. And that very gift of the Spirit is so important for us to cherish, because that very gift of the Spirit validates that even when we perceive the Lord's absence, God is there. Never distracted always listening to us, always attending to us through the Spirit, translating and receiving the cries of our heart when words fail. And as we continue to speak and to listen, let us also be sure to monitor and regulate the static and volume in our lives. Because sometimes, not every time, but sometimes we can't hear or sense the Holy Spirit because our lives are too loud. Again, another story. It's like true confessions with Pastor Chris this morning. When I was much younger than fourth grade, when I was much younger, um, I remember the first time getting exposed to kind of finding your pulse. You know, you you check your wrist or you check your neck. We did this as a little kid in school. The thing is, I could never find my pulse. I could never feel my pulse. And it actually became like one of those things I obsessed about as a little kid. I was really freaked out that I couldn't feel my pulse. I was convinced I didn't have a pulse. Doctor would be like, you have a pulse. I can't feel it. I, I can feel I can't feel it. It's not there. I don't have a pulse. I mean, I really got upset about this. I didn't like it when people would bring up their pulse because I didn't have one, you know? <laughs> it's true. And then there was a good friend who told me, here's what you need to do. Tonight when you go to sleep, I want you to put your head on the side of the pillow and breathe slowly and try to block out everything else and just listen. And I thought this was just nuts. I'm like, look, if I can't feel it here and I can't feel it here, I don't know what putting my head on the side of the pillow is going to do for me to hear my pulse. But I did it. I was desperate. And if you've experienced this before, I think most of us in this room have, after a while, I heard it. The tiny, rhythmic pulsation of my heart beating blood into my body. And I'll never forget how absolutely just enthralled I was in that moment, both relieved, but just taken with this Simple sound. I lay there for hours until I finally fell asleep, just listening, listening to that pounding whisper 
that's always there keeping us alive even when we can't hear it, even when we are asleep. My friends, so it is with a person of the Holy Spirit. Like Elijah, I don't know who you relate to. I could have preached on Elijah, but I've done that text a lot. Like, I'm a lot like Elijah in that for me, it's often in the silence that I find the Holy Spirit. It's only as I turn down my preoccupation with other things, it's only as I turn over my anxiety and my worry that I can begin to perceive the pulsing beat of the Spirit not only keeping me alive, but continuing to do a good work in and through me despite what I can see, despite what I can hear, despite how I feel. Hearing means listening. Sometimes, not always, I can't hear the Spirit because I'm too busy talking over the Spirit. I sure hope I'm not the only person that this is a a problem for, but I can sometimes get so fixated on telling God what his answer should be, what he needs to do. I have no bandwidth to listen as God repeats to me who he is, to listen and be reminded through the Spirit of how God has worked and continues to work in my life as well as what he's looking to do beyond me to accomplish in this world. In this psalm, Psalm 22, David honestly expresses his grief and his pain, his perceptions of God's absence and silence. He just keeps, as I said earlier, keeps calling out to God. But did you notice, if it's still open, you can see it. Notice after where we read verse 8, David's conversation changes as he listens. David moves, it's profound, it's startling. David moves from extreme fear to confident hope. Some scriptures are going to pop up for you to look at. Even though he's still waiting for an answer, he's still waiting for an answer, a sign. David reorients his view of the present silence and loneliness he is feeling in light of God's past presence and faithfulness. And doing this not only enables David to hold on in the present, but even crazy as this psalm ends, to give praise to God for a future that is yet unrealized for him. This leads me to my next encouragement for us. Recognize in the midst of how it feels that God is never truly silent in our lives for he has given us his word. This is the very reason why God gives us his written word so that we can always remain in a constant state of communication with him. In these pages is not just a story of people like us. In these pages is not just a collection of do's and don'ts, of rights and wrongs. This is the very revelation of the person, the character, the will of God, the mind, the heart, and the purposes of God. When we can't hear the Lord, when we can't see the Lord, when the Lord feels so very far away, Don't forget, remember, the Lord is as close, as audible, as visible as his very word in our hands. Again, sometimes, not always, but sometimes when I'm searching for a clear indication of the Spirit's presence and voice in my life, and then I turn to God's word, surprise, surprise, I find the Spirit already has spoken. The Spirit is speaking, but I didn't hear, I didn't listen because it's not what I wanted to hear. Because I don't like what the Spirit said. And then there are other times when God seems absent or silent in my life and I've turned to God's Word and again, I've realized the Spirit has spoken, has given me direction previously, but I just ignored it. And just like in any other conversation, picture it. If you're in a conversation with another person, if a person is talking with you and you're not paying any attention to them, if you're not acknowledging them, they're not just going to keep talking. Sometimes as parents, and I know not all of us in this room are parents, but we've had a parent, parents sometimes have this tendency to repeat things to our children over and over again. It drives them crazy, right? We say nothing else. We just keep repeating the same thing. We keep repeating the same thing until they acknowledge and follow the directions we just gave them. Our Heavenly Father is no different. God is regularly speaking to us through his word and by his spirit. Sometimes what we perceive as silence in our waiting for the Lord to answer is actually the Lord waiting for us to take his word to heart. Not just letting it go in one ear and out the other, but instead internalizing it, 
meditating upon it, making it our own, living out his words through our lives. We can't receive more if we aren't following what we are given. My friends, just because the Spirit feels absent or silent doesn't mean the Spirit is absent or silent in our lives. We may feel alone or abandoned by God, and that feeling is very real, but it is just that, a feeling. A very real feeling, but again, feelings, what we feel is not the best indicator of what is true. And we need to hear this more and more because we are becoming a world where what is true is based upon what we feel. And what we feel has never been and never will be the best indicator of what is true. Feelings are fickle. You don't need me to tell you that. Feelings are fickle. Facts are not. God's word deals in facts. What is true, not feelings, which can change. The person of the Holy Spirit, contrary to how we often present and describe the work of the Holy Spirit, is not primarily about engaging us through our feelings. Much of the confusion and I think much of the trouble sometimes in our relationship with the Holy Spirit, person of the Holy Spirit, is we also often make in the Trinity the Holy Spirit the touchy-feely part of God. The Holy Spirit's the one that engages your feelings. And so the Holy Spirit's work is all about spiritual goosebumps or hairs going up in the back of your head or somehow having some kind of very emotional experience. And I'm not negating that those realities exist, that the Spirit can work through our emotions. But what I want you to hear is the primary work of the Holy Spirit, just like the primary work of God, is not to engage us through our feelings, but to engage us through the truth of his word. Another way to say this, rather than leading us to feel our way into our beliefs, The Spirit guides us to believe our way into feeling what is right and true. Faith is not born of feeling. And for many of you, this is an earth-shattering revelation because your faith is born of what you feel. And I hate to tell you, if your faith is born of what you feel, then your faith is going to go like this a lot. Your life is going to go like this a lot because feelings fluctuate. Faith is not born of feeling. Faith is born and built upon fact. Our emotions come out of what we believe. It's not the other way around. If our emotions are the basis for what we we believe, again, our beliefs exist on shaky and fluctuating ground. Our feelings arise from the facts of our faith. And the fact is, through his death, Jesus has reconciled us to God. The fact is, Jesus' resurrection vindicates once and forever all that could separate us from God, even death itself, has been removed. The fact is, Jesus promises he would never leave or forsake us. The fact is, we are never alone even when we feel lonely because God didn't come down in Jesus Christ to leave you behind, but to bring you home. The fact is, Jesus didn't come back from the dead so we could all end up wasting away in the grave. The fact is, Jesus came back from the grave and kicked open the door so that we would live the life we were intended for, a full, abundant, and everlasting life. The fact is, regardless of how we feel, the Lord couldn't be any closer to us than God is right now through the person of the Holy Spirit. Amen.